Hmm. Oh God, thy sea is so great, and my boat is so small. Teacher, do you not care that we perish? The disciples, crossing the Sea of Galilee, a large lake, they freak out. Now these are men who are used to, you, to working on the sea, right? These men are fishermen. And yet, how is it that they are freaking out because they are stuck in a squall? Fear. Fear is a powerful force in the world. And it can sometimes overshadow faith. But how does Jesus reply? This is from the Message Translation, a transliteration by Eugene Peterson. Have you no faith? Haven't you been listening? Wake up. Show a little trust in God. Have courage. The smallness you feel comes from inside you. Trust in God's faithfulness to you. For the ancient ones, the sea was chaotic and mysterious. It was a dangerous place. The storm at sea is unpredictable, it is dangerous, and it presents real danger to their lives. And they know it well because these men are sailors. They are fishermen. And when I, you know, when I read this, as an armchair sailor, but not a fisherman. I don't like guts and things. It's no good. But I love to eat fish. But as an armchair fisherman, I realized that when Jesus calms the storm and it is a dead calm, they went from one extreme to another. They went from having way too much wind and rain to having nothing at all. And being stuck in the doldrums is no good. But that's another sermon for another day. For the ancient ones, though, this is a real threat to their lives. But likewise, for us, the storms in our lives, right, metaphorical, can create within us feelings of hopelessness and despair and the fear of the unknown we experience as we feel caught in the pull of the maelstroms of our lives can be overwhelming. I would say that this episode has much to say to us today as individuals, as a community of St. Patrick's, and as a nation. It speaks directly into that smallness that we each of us feel inside us. That smallness that keeps us from becoming the fullness of who you and I were created to be by God. I would venture to say that this episode doesn't happen at night as a throwaway detail. The darkness of night and the chaos of the sea, they're both powerful motifs at play here. And they speak to the foreboding we all feel in our hearts when we are witness to the chaos at work in the world today. Do you know what I'm talking about? Can you feel it in your heart? Do you have a gripping in your belly? But Jesus, ever faithful and strong to save, is ever mindful of the smallness that we feel that comes from inside us. Because he's been there before. He goes before us and he knows what it is to feel afraid. He knows that we are afraid. And yet he says to us, do not be afraid. I love you and I will show you that God's love never fails. He is confident because of his experience with the Father 
the all-sufficient power of God that is available to him and to all of those who love and know God, he recognizes that the storms of life will not cease, that bullies will continue to threaten, and external factors, real or imagined, may put one at risk of life and limb, but nothing in all of creation will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And this is how he lives his life. This is how he invites us to live ours. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. He knows this because he knows that love is the way. And he knows it's the way because he knows love never fails. He bets his life on it. And you see, Christ is ministering to the disciples even in the midst of their chaos, even in the midst of their honest and plaintive pleas. Do you not care that we're perishing? It reflects their fear and their faithlessness. The gospel doesn't shy away from acknowledging the faithlessness that is often felt by the disciples of Jesus, but it also provides confidence in the never failing care and concern of God, the God of love, for them, for their well-being. In this story, today, Jesus castigates his own disciples. Why are you afraid? Now, I don't want to get, like, church nerdy here, but I will because I think it reveals something. The word in Greek here that Jesus uses for afraid this first time is deelos, deelos. And it is literally translated as dreaders, dreaders. It could also be understood as cowards. Why are you dreaders? Why are you cowards? It, its use is different from the word phobon, from which we get the word phobia, and which is used in the very next verse, and they feared exceedingly, is the literal translation. But our lectionary translates it as, and they were filled with great awe. Quite a different translation there, isn't it? It is meant to be, they feared exceedingly. They were afraid when the wind and the rain were in a squall and threatening to sink their boat. But they were exceedingly fearful when Jesus calms the storm and silences the wind. That's when the fear comes. The intentional use of deelos communicates something deeper then. It evokes a sense of inward defect that is the cause for the disciples' fear, which is more akin to cowardliness or timidity. There is something within them which keeps them from knowing the kind of peace, the pervasive sense of well-being which Jesus is experiencing even in the chaotic and dangerous squall. He knows the threat is real. But the greatest threat, he knows, is the one from within. The smallness you feel comes from inside you. Why are you afraid? In a sense, Jesus poses them with a question that really has nothing to do with wind or rain or waves crashing in on them. Jesus knows what they need. He knows that they must first remedy the fear from within. What are you afraid of? On one side of the lake, the people are Jewish, and that's where he's coming from. But on the other side of the lake the side that Jesus asks his disciples to take him, the people are Gentile. Now that translates as other, unknown, maybe even judged as being bad and wrong, maybe being uh, judged as people who don't deserve, definitely people who are not in the club. 
Now, these disciples have been put into a situation where they are at the effect of a larger dynamic which is out of their control, the storm, but they are also gripped by fear, the anxiety about predicting the future, the fear of the unknown. The fear of what lies waiting for them on the other side of the lake. In fact, what waits for them, as we'll hear next week, are the very forces of evil and dis-ease when they are immediately confronted by a demon-possessed man. They fear disaster, the kind of fear that grips the belly and won't let go, the kind that keeps them small. The fear of everything going out of control. I'm not sure we can relate, Catherine. And after Jesus quiets the storm, he then asks them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Jesus says, in effect, do you not understand that it is precisely in the midst of the storm when your confidence is shaken and you lack the courage of your own conviction? That is precisely when God is at God's best, providing you everything you need. Maybe not what you want, but what you need, even providing that which you cannot even know that you need at this moment, and not simply for your survival, but God providing for you and your thriving. In the midst of struggle and pain and challenge, Jesus knows that the God who hovered over the deep, who speaks in the parable of Job, calls the world into being out of the chaos at the beginning of time, is the same God who is strong enough to save when we are gripped with fear in the chaotic storms of our deepest places within. O God, thy sea is so great, and my boat is so small. In Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, Paul admonishes with the same tone that Jesus rebukes his own disciples. Dear Corinthians, he writes, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life, the good life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel is from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. I appreciate how Eugene Peterson transliterates this passage. The smallness you feel is from inside you. It is the same inner fear, the delos, the dread the cowardice, the spirit of fear that Jesus calls out in his friends. Jesus wants to calm the storms within them, within us, by expanding our hearts, making them bigger and mightier, not with our own power, but with the supernatural, mighty power of God living within us. And his invitation is to enter the wide-open, spacious life of joy, pervasive well-being, which is to live in the kingdom of God. We're all troubled by the storms of life. No one can promise you that faith will be a magic talisman against difficulties arising in your life. If you've lived long enough, you know that that's not true. The good news that Jesus proclaims is that the kingdom of heaven is available to you and to me at all times, and it is found within. It's built that way by design. It goes where you go. The wide open, spacious, good life of joy you seek is within you. Where those storms rage in your heart, the kingdom of God is available there. In the chaos of your mind, where anxiety and dread can so easily rule, the kingdom of God is available there too. When you feel the smallness inside you, 
When you get that letter in the mail and you know who it's from, when that phone call comes and the phone rings and your stomach grips, or when your wife says to you, I think we should talk. Not that I've experienced that, but you could maybe relate, I'm not sure. The kingdom is available there too. When you have anxiety about an unknown future or a sense of powerlessness when you read the newspaper or watch the news or not talk to that neighbor, if you feel like you can't make a difference in the world, in those moments, the plaintive words of the anguished disciples, do you not care that we are perishing? They don't seem so outrageous after all. As we have said here many times before, there are two forces at play in the world, just two, from which all decisions, choices, actions, opinions, judgments, all of them are derivative. Say them with me. They are love and fear. There are two forces in the world, love and fear. These two forces are in constant battle within us, within our hearts and minds. If you don't think that that's true, you just look at the marketing and the commercials that are on television today. They know it's true, and they are not there usually to use love to move your heart and mind. We've spent the better part of two months focusing on Paul's sermon on love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8a. The attributes of love are, say them with me, patience, kindness, forbearance, hope, faith. But the culmination of the whole thing is love never fails. Say that with me. Love never fails. Fails. One more time. Love never God's love never fails. The smallness you feel comes from fear deep within, but the power of God's love will never fail you because God's love can do for you precisely that which you cannot do for yourself, no matter how hard you try. We must simply find a way to let God into the deepest hidden places of our hearts and minds. And so you won't hear this very often from this pulpit, but I will say it today with confidence. Here is how to have courage even when you feel so small inside. Practice loving God. It's that simple. Begin to put into practice the things that Jesus taught. Begin to put into practice the things that Jesus taught. He did not teach us how to wear vestments and make them look pretty. Jesus wasn't creating Baptists or Protestants or Catholics. The Great Commission at the end of Matthew is not, Go unto the ends of the earth and make Episcopalians. Jesus isn't caught up in tradition. As a matter of fact, he calls out tradition all the time. That's why he's on the case of Pharisees and clergy types like me all the time. Because it is not the tradition that you lean on. Now, it may be a practice. It may be a discipline. It may be a beautiful way of practicing the love of God. But... The tradition without the love of God and the power therein is a clanging symbol. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. God's love can do for you precisely what you cannot do for yourself. 
put into practice the things that Jesus taught. Begin practicing patience, kindness. Rejoice in the truth. Bear all things. Hope all things. Believe all things. Learn from Jesus how to love God, because that's what he does. After all, that's all he does. He loves God and helps us see how to do that and do as God does. Love the things that God loves. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. And do not worry about how or by what power you will love as God does, for the love of Christ urges us on in this work. Mark Twain said, Courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not the absence of fear. We will still be afraid, and sometimes rightly so, but our faith, that is walking by faith and not by sight, will sustain us and give us mastery of fear. Because Mark Twain also said, the fear of death follows from the fear of life person who lives fully is prepared to die at any moment. So open wide your hearts. Open wide your hearts to the love of God which never fails and enter the wide open spacious life. Come to me, Jesus says, all you who are burdened by the smallness you feel inside. All you who are heavy laden with anxiety, in fear of the unknown, come to me and I will give you rest, even in the storm. Though the storms may come, and they surely will, and though we may face tomorrow with uncertainties and unknowns, living wide open to God's never-failing love, we have no need to fear the smallness. And we have no need to fear the smallness that runs other people. We can face the chaos with courage. We can enter the wide open, spacious life of the kingdom within. The first step, seek first the kingdom of God within you. And the wide open, spacious life you seek is yours. So what will it be? Fear? or love.